Hi everyone, my name is Chris, and I'm a graduate student in Jan Scottheim's lab at Stanford University. Um, today I'm excited to share with you our ongoing research on the mechanisms of proteome remodeling with increase in cell size. In our lab, we are interested in studying cell size regulation, and we think that this is important because um, the cell size really sets the context for everything that happens inside the cell. So, for example, um, a lot of um, the talks that we've already heard today, for example, like cytoplasmic diffusion and many essential biochemical reactions, all happen within the context of this, how big that size cell is. And we know at the bulk level um, that a lot of these processes, um, for example, like biosynthetic processes of the proteins and mRNA, um, they increase in scale to match um, with the increase in cell size. And we also know, for example, the organelles and the nuclear uh, nu nucleus and the nucleolus, they also increase um, to keep up with the increase in cell size. Now, of course, um, there are size-independent um, components inside the cell, most notably the genomic DNA. And, but in our lab, we've also um, found some proteins that do not increase proportionally with the increase in cell size. Um, notably, for example, the uh, WE5 protein and the budding yeast. And this WE5 protein is an inhibitor in the G1S um, transition. And you can appreciate that in this graph here, the concentration of that WE5 protein decreases as the cell size increases. And this is in contrast to CLIN3, which is a G1S cyclin. So this acts as a cell cycle activator in the G1S phase so that will push the cell cycle through. And that concentration is constant. So you can see how with the increase in cell size, the cell now can receive a cell-dependent signal on how big that cell is, thus triggering a cell division and providing an avenue of cell size regulation. And we found a similar mechanism also um, in mammalian cells and with the RB. So clearly, um, non-scaling proteins can serve important regulatory functions, and we wanted to identify if there were other proteins um, that could do similar things at a more global scale. So to do this, uh, two postdocs in the lab, um, they took human primary or immortalized um, human cells, and then they sorted them in G1 phase and also into three different sizes using um, facts, small, medium, and large. And then they were able to plot these um, proteins detected through mass spectrometry at these different sizes and um, basically run a linear regression through them and um, see how that protein concentration changes with cell size. And this is a metric I'll be talking about throughout the presentation, the slope here. So if the slope is near zero, it means that the steady, that protein maintains a steady concentration with cell size. And if it's greater than zero, it has increasing concentration. And then finally, if it's less than zero, it has decreasing concentration with cell size. So when they did this experiment, um, we indeed found that many proteins maintained steady concentration with cell size, as we expected. But we also found, to our surprise, that a lot of proteins kind of fell in the spectrum of increasing concentration and also decreasing concentration. And this was very highly replicable between um, these two experiments. So my question when I came into the lab was trying to think about these different processes that happen within the biosynthetic pathway and how each of these processes could contribute to the proteome remodeling that occurs. And today, I want to talk to you today about the two processes that I've looked at so far, which is the transcription and the, the proteome turnover. To do this, we um, needed a different system where we could stably maintain cell sizes of different sizes. And to do this, um, I chose to manipulate the G1 phase of the cell cycle. So here it's showing the G1 as it's a cell cycle, and then here are, you can see the G1 phase, and it's driven by the cyclin D CDK46 activity. And what you can do is by um, reducing or increasing that activity, you can slow down or speed up the cell cycle. And because the cell is still growing at this phase, you can therefore um, manipulate the sizes thereof. And this was a cell line um, that we got from a gift from Ioannis Sanitas, who now has a, his own group in Roswell. Um, and basically, it's a doxycycline inducible um, cyclin D knockdown of the mRNA. But then we can also, on top of that, add back the wild type version of the cyclin D, also driven by the doxycycline um, inducible promoter. And this acts as essentially what is an overexpression of the cyclin D um, inside the cell. 
observe what happens when we do the induction. So you can appreciate from just here on the blue line, if you only have um, the cyclone D1 knockdown, you have cells that increase in size um, and then reach this new kind of steady um, cell size where they're a little bit larger in the, in the beginning. And then you have the converse where if you have the cyclone D1 uh, wild type version, you now decrease in cell size until you then reach a new stable uh, small cell size. To check that uh, the proteome remodeling that we see that um, that we see in the sorted cells is also reflected here in the genetic knockdown model that we, we can, we ran the mass spectrometry there and you can appreciate that um, the data that we collected from the sorted cell lines is well mirrored here in the genetic knockdown model as well. Okay, so we then wanted to look at um, how the transcript, chan transcript changes can also uh, explain protein changes. So we ran RNA-seq um, at these different cell sizes um, oh, and one thing I did, sorry, forget to mention is that we have, so here is small and large cells, but if you don't induce them and just have a controlled DMSO, you also gain, can gain a medium-sized cell. So you have, in a sense, it's kind of three different cell sizes. So we can plot these cells, um, plot the transcript changes with these different sizes. And here are some examples of some of the um, concentration changes of the transcripts at these different sizes. You have one going up and stable and going down. And at the global level, you can appreciate that the RNA slope is actually a little bit skewed um, to the left um, from the zero line, potentially reflecting some um, moderate slowdown in the cell growth as the cell increases in size. And finally, to answer our question, how much does transcription um, contribute to the changes in the proteome? We can do the correlation, and we see that's a pretty a fair correlation of, with the Pearson R of 0.64. Next, we also wanted to look at the protein turnover. And to do this, we employed dynamic SILAC TMT. Um, and here, what we do is we culture the cells in, um, in media that contains amino acids of certain weight, so for example, like light isotopes. And at a cer certain point here in time zero, we can switch the media containing um, amino acids of heavier weights. And this can be detected through mass spectrometry. And by monitoring the proportion of remaining light um, amino acid bearing proteins, you can also monitor how quickly that protein is turned over in this time. And here is an example of a certain protein. And here you can appreciate from um, in the beginning, you have this uh, protein that then falls. The light protein is um, replaced by the heavy protein. And here we can take um, time it takes to reach the 50% of the Im initial amount as a measure of how quickly that protein is turned around. We can, can call that T50 here. So um, we can now look at, at the rate of change of the protein turnover with cell size, as we have been doing with four genes and um, proteins. And these are the, some of the examples of slopes that we can get. Um, here, one caveat I will mention is that um, a lot of the proteins that are turned over in the human cell lines are regulated not just by active degradation, but also by cell division. So here, just for simplicity's sake, I've focused on um, more short-lived proteins, the ones that are, we are relatively more confident are just regulated by active degradation alone. And when we do that, we can see that a lot of the proteins, they do not change in their degradation uh, with their increase in cell size. And to answer our question, how much does this protein turnover or degradation rate contribute to the protein scaling? There's some moderate amount, um, and it's not nothing, but it's definitely less than the transcript scaling slope. Okay, so. Um, we looked at both the transcription and the translation, transcription and the protein turnover. Now we can kind of combine those two into a, a, a simple model here on the OLS regression. And we can see that um, all combined together, we can explain about 58% of the data using those two jumps. Um, and yeah, and thank you for listening. <laughs>